My name is Yuva Chirla. I'm one of the co-chairs of uh, Toronto Chapter of uh, Financial Executive Network. My other co-chairs are Masrur and Liliana, and uh, both of them couldn't join today. Masrur might join a little bit later. And let me introduce uh, Dr. Tim Jackson, who is the president of Jackson Leadership and a leadership assessment and coaching expert with 17 years of experience. He has assessed and coached leaders across a variety of sectors, including agriculture, chemicals, consumer products, finance, logistics, and many other. And not, Tim has also worked with leaders in North America, Western Europe, and China. And Tim has published a lot of articles and, and uh, in different magazines that include Forbes.com, Global Mail, and peer-reviewed journals. He has also shared details of his coaching practice at leading conferences like the Society of Industrial and Organizational Psychology. In addition to SIOP, he is also a member of the Society of Consulting Psychology. He has a PhD in Industrial Organizational Psychology from the University of Western Ontario, and Tim lives in Toronto. And today's topic is maximizing maximizing the value of leadership development. Tim? Thank you, Siva. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with, with you guys. And uh, thank you, Siva, for the introduction. Um, I spoke to uh, uh, FENG Toronto back in 2016, and I had a really great experience. Uh, it was a very warm uh, welcome and a warm audience. Uh, so I'm really happy to be able to rejoin your group, and and I hope you find uh, some of the the insights that I'm going to share today to be to be valuable. So let me just put up my screen. And can people see the screen, yep. okay? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So the topic that uh, I'd like to focus on today is uh, how to maximize the uh, value of going through a leadership development experience. So um, <clears throat> I'll just get right into it. The, uh, the purpose of the presentation is really just to, it's, it's twofold. So to, to go through um, and introduce you to what organizational development looks like in uh, in most companies these days, so what, what, how, it, how it shows up and what form it takes. And I'd also like to um, uh, kind of ask you to imagine going through a leadership process yourselves and and for three of those uh, sort of steps in the process, I'm going to ask you to think about what that might be like, and then I'll provide some suggestions and some advice on how you might uh, sort of prepare for and navigate through those different steps in the process in order to gain the most benefit from the experience. So, um, yeah, and Siva, you, you mentioned uh, some of my background already, so um, I won't spend too much time on this. But uh, yeah, I spent uh, almost two decades working in leadership development, focusing on in-depth assessment, uh, goal setting, which is another uh, way of saying development planning. So I might say development planning today that really just refers to goal setting uh, and executive coaching. Um, I've worked across with clients across the world, across different industries, uh, across different levels from CEO to frontline managers. I've managed teams of coaches and delivering uh, larger scale projects. Um, so I, I handpick the coaches, I select them, I pull the team together, and then we deliver bigger projects. And I kind of, um, I get a chance to look at leadership development from, from that project management vantage point as well. And, uh, yeah, my background is in industrial organizational psychology. Um, and, uh, when I was in graduate school, I actually did research on, on leadership and the drivers of leadership effectiveness. So it's been a very unifying kind of uh, theme throughout my career and one that I've uh, continued to enjoy. So let me just give you an overall framework for the presentation today. <clears throat> I'd like to talk a bit about uh, what leadership development is, give you a sense of what it looks like, uh, some different forms uh, and types of programs that, that, can, that can be delivered. I'll talk a little bit about who participates in these sorts of programs. And then, as I said, I wanna go through three different key steps in the leadership development process and uh, talk to you about how to squeeze the most value out of each of those. So the first step will be receiving feedback, We'll talk a bit about how to how to receive and process in-depth feedback in a way that you can distill key messages from it. It sounds really simple, but it's actually um, quite a quite a challenging, emotionally, mentally challenging part of the process. 
we'll talk a bit about how to build a great development plan. We set a set some goals that are really motivating for you, that are you know linked to your assessment results, um, but also kind of fit with what you want to work on, and that can um, you know lead you to some positive behavior change. And then I'll also talk about uh, coaching. Coaching is a term that uh, gets thrown around pretty pretty frequently in society these days and in corporate settings. But what does coaching mean, and 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 how should you think about engaging in a coaching engage you know, a relationship with somebody? I'll talk. I'll try to demystify what coaching is. Explain a little bit about the the dynamics in the coaching in, engagement, and uh, and I'll suggest some ways that you can get the most value from from working with a coach. Uh, so you feel like you get what you want out of that uh, experience. Okay, so on the overview part, <clears throat> let me just start by saying that um, leadership development, not surprisingly, is, a, is a, it's a set of programs that are used to improve leadership skills, but more specifically, they tend to involve one or more of the following components. So first component is feedback. There's a lot of feedback that's given in leadership programs. Um, they can, that can come in uh, the form of a survey, so doing a 360 survey where you gather feedback from coworkers. It can come from working in groups with people where you're, say, practicing skills, you know, practicing some kind of leadership skill in a, in a simulation type setting. And you have, you know, you're working with a partner, then you have a, another partner that's kind of like watching you um, and giving you feedback on how, how you're expressing the skill. Maybe you're practicing how to be, you know, be an inspirational communicator or something like that. So feedback is a really important part of these programs. <clears throat> another important part is uh, teaching concepts related to leadership. So this looks like you know a typical classroom type setting where you have a facilitator or a professor uh, coach um, at the, at the top, you know front of the class disseminating information it tends to be kind of one way flow of information you know about what what the best practices or best principles are in terms of uh, how to be a great leader goal setting is another key component of leadership programs so uh, pretty much any program you're involved with that that's you know, focus on leadership training will ask you to take any insights that you gather from the feedback portion or certain maybe survey data assessment portion. It will ask you to take any insights you gain from the teaching component and then we'll um, encourage you to set some goals based on that. So you can kind of translate that knowledge into into application. You can kind of close, as they say, close, close the knowing doing gap. Like you, you take that knowledge and kind of put it into practice. Um, another component is action learning. So action learning is uh, is basically a forum for practicing skills. So um, in a one-on-one -on -one coaching type in, uh, leadership engagement, uh, action learning happens in between the coaching sessions. So you you leave the coaching session with a plan of some kind of skill you wanna try out or practice. And then you you do that in the real world with, you know, on, on the job. And then you come back to the next session and you talk about how it went with your, with your coach and you kind of debrief. In a group setting, like I said before, sometimes you'll be in a, in a group setting, you'll get divided up into small pods, maybe say a group of three, two people will practice a skill and one person in that pod will observe and then provide feedback on how well you're performing that skill. That's an action learning experience as well. So it's really about applying skills, practicing skills in a, in a real world kind of environment. And the last component is social support. So, so leadership programs that are focused on coaching uh, deliver social support <clears throat> in the relationship that develops between the coach and the participant. And in group settings, you could be in a, let's say you're in an executive MBA program. Um, you might have a work group that you're doing projects with. You might you know, share kind of leadership war stories with them. You might talk about you know, successes and failures you've had in, in the realm of leadership. They might give you advice or reactions or feedback. So you can learn some, some things about uh, leadership that way and just by gaining some of that, the social support and, and through those relationships. Okay, there's different types of leadership programs. So one that I've tended to focus on in my work is the individualized program. Um, and I have a slide subsequent to this one where I'm gonna bring up a diagram and show you exactly how that works step by step. But for now, I just wanted to say that this individualized program um, kind of forms the backbone of this presentation. So the three steps in the process that I'm gonna focus on giving some suggestions or, or advice about are really taken from this individualized process. So I just want to make that clear. Uh, we talked about, uh, you know, uh, the teaching kind of component of leadership programs. So, so workshops are another format. These are typically used for early career professionals because the cost on a per person basis tends to be uh, a little bit lower. 
uh, for, for group training. So um, typically what'll happen is earlier career professionals will go to workshops on like foundational management skills or foundational leadership skills, you know, maybe before they step into their first managerial role or just after. Um, the hybrid uh, version is often used in business schools. And so this, when I say hybrid, I just really mean that um, these programs take a whole bunch of different learning methods and kind of combine them together. So imagine going through an uh, executive MBA program there's a teaching component where you're in class and you're learning content and principles. There's maybe uh, facilitated discussions where you have a, a group facilitator who's not so much teaching, but is just trying to develop a robust conversation between the participants. You might have group work where you're in a pod of, of other students and you're working on group topics or group projects. And then you also might have an assessment and coaching component. So <clears throat> you may be asked to take a 360, uh, fill out some personality inventories. You may be given a coach. Someone told me recently that at uh, <coughs> excuse me at the Queen's uh, Queen School of Business, um, the executive MBA program, each person gets assigned uh, an individual executive coach, a life coach, and then each team has a team coach. So there's a huge amount of like coaching that goes on in that in that whole experience. Uh, specialized topics or participants. So the specialized topics refer to um, leadership programs that are oriented around a specific theme. So think of women in leadership. What are the key uh, topics, issues that come up for women in the workplace as they try to, to lead effectively? Um, specialized participants, these are programs that are designed for a specific population. So for example, a pharma company um, told me recently that uh, they have a separate leadership program for their salespeople. And then they have another separate program, leadership program for their research and development people. And then their corporate people have an entirely different uh, leadership program. So it's just dividing up the content of the program according to different populations. Finally, networking groups are um, really like opportunities to kind of get in with a get in with a new group of people, build some social capital, build some relationships. But in the process, there's some kind of educational component that involves learning about leadership. So an example of this would be uh, young presidents organization. So this is an organization that has chapters all over the world. You, if you're a president and you're under a certain age, I'm not sure what the cap is, but you, uh, assuming you get in, you meet a bunch of other presidents who are kind of at a similar uh, career stage and you network with them and you build relationships, but you also have opportunities maybe for mentoring from people that are uh, maybe a bit older than you, maybe formal, maybe informal mentoring, formal mentoring, but they also bring in speakers that uh, give talks about leadership topics. There's usually affiliations with uh, educational institutions uh, where, where experts will come in and, and talk about leadership. So that's a different approach to, uh, to leadership. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so this is the uh, individualized program process that I, that I um, alluded to a moment ago. I just, so I just wanna walk you through what the process looks like so you have a sense of how it unfolds. And again, this is the process that I typically use with, with my work and I've used it for over a decade now. So it's, and it's fairly standard throughout the industry. So uh, other people who do what I do would, would use a similar kind of approach. So let me just explain it here step-by-step. Step. So in the first two steps, I usually combine actually the first two steps into one step. So. In the first stage, the introductory and exploratory meeting, this involves walking the participant through basically the steps involved in the process, you know, the logistical sort of flow of, of steps and milestones, excuse me. And at the same time, having an exploratory discussion where uh, we conduct a background interview. So I asked the, the participant about how they got to where they are in their career, what uh, kinds of values shape who they are as a professional, how they self-assess their strengths and weaknesses now in advance of getting any kind of feedback uh, from an assessment process. Uh, you know, what are they, what's their, what's their, how would they def define their current leadership style? How would they define their idealized leadership style that they want to move towards? So really just trying to get a sense of who this person is and what their background is. Uh, the next step, step three, is the assessment phase. So <clears throat> what this typically looks like in my programs is a combination of 360 surveys and personality inventories. 360 surveys are usually, you know, can take one of two forms. They can be either online questionnaires where you get a link in your email and you click on it and you fill out a bunch of questions about a person, or they can be uh, interview-based. So I, I typically do interview-based. Uh, interview-based uh, 360s are more often used for more senior populations. And that's where, you know, if you're a rater, you would be contacted by a consultant and then you would schedule a 30 to 60 minute interview and, and then provide your feedback about that person uh, that way. 
So then after step three, the, the person who's the coach or consultant like myself would go away and kind of aggregate all the data. And then they would meet with the uh, leader participant in step four. So this is the feedback phase where you kind of unpack all the key themes from the data. You know, you'd hand over the report. Here's the report. Here's what we found. Here are the key key messages that seem to be bubbling up. And there's usually a lot of dialogue about, you know, okay, what does this mean? Uh, asking questions about, you know, clarifying uh, the results and, and interpreting them. Then in step five, uh, it says early coaching here, but this is really a, a, a goal formation or goal setting uh, kind of step. So there's usually two or three meetings where um, the participant and the coach meet to basically translate all that feedback data into a set of goals and objectives that they might want to work on uh, and basically create an early version of their development plan or a draft of their development plan. And then in step six, uh, the, the coach, the leader participant, and the supervisor of the participant meet together in a three-way meeting to share the uh, uh, draft version of the development plan and to ask the supervisor for any feedback about it. Um, then in step seven, um, this is called the active coaching phase. I call it active coaching because it just refers to the idea that the coaching takes place after the form formalization of the development plan. So uh, in this step, there's usually six to eight different sessions that happen over you know, nine months to a year. And the uh, the coach and the leader participant meet and basically try to make as much progress as they can against the against the development plan or against the goals. And then the last step is a is a final review in which the supervisor is brought back into the process. So again, there's a three way meeting with the supervisor, participant, and coach, where they sit down and talk about what was achieved in the process and what uh, what still remains to be done. And as the coach kind of hands the baton and hands the responsibility for supporting development back to the supervisor. Uh, we talk a little bit about what that involves and how the supervisor can support the, the, the leader going forward, the leader participant. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> last, I just wanted to mention again that the three uh, areas in which I'll provide some suggestions uh, tonight involve um, the feedback phase, the goal setting phase, and the coaching phase. So those are the, the parts of the process that I wanted to focus my suggestions on in this presentation. Okay, uh, who, who goes into leadership programs? Um, well, uh, probably as you would expect, um, a, a leading candidate is somebody who's considered high potential. Usually this is somebody that's been with a company for a period of time. They're kind of in the middle of their career. They've accomplished a fair bit already, so they may already be at the executive level. They might be kind of vice president or above. And um, everybody kind of agrees that this person is going places like they have the potential to be you know sitting in one of the most senior level positions in the company and the organization wants to give them a bit of stretch they want to give them a bit of challenge they want to you know push them and see how far they can they can go in terms of their development and uh, and those people usually do quite well in this kind of process another uh, key participant or frequent participant is a senior leader so this is somebody say at the senior vice president level or above um, maybe they have never gone through leadership development before. Maybe they have just taken on a new responsibility that's extremely stressful and they need a bit of support. Um, maybe they've just changed jobs into a new functional area and they need a bit of support and help as they kind of get oriented. So senior leaders are also a key sort of participant group. Uh, people that are onboarding into new roles, uh, that could also be a situation where the organization decides to put someone through a leadership development process. As a caveat, in these situations, um, somebody would uh, not go through a typical kind of assessment process because when you're, you're in a new role, <clears throat> you're, all your stakeholders don't really know you as well. So you can't really do a 360 survey because those, all those attitudes about the leader participant are really just forming and, and beginning to take shape. So um, what happens for the assessment part is usually the, the leader participant will just kind of self-report or self-assess some of their needs say oh, i think i need to work on this i think i need to work on that and that that will kind of feed into a goal setting or development planning process and then you can kick off the coaching engagement from there um, major organizational change is another reason why people might get uh, selected for a leadership program so in my experience in big companies uh doing big big change uh often doesn't go very well you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things that can go wrong. Turnover can increase uh, significantly, and so sometimes companies will unlock some budget room to do to do leadership development to try to mitigate some of those uh, risks, um, to give people some support as they go through the process, the change process, and also to 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 hopefully retain them. And I would say that 
uh, leadership programs are used as a bit of a retention tool in some cases, and this might be one of those uh, cases. The last uh, profile of uh, a participant in these kinds of programs is someone who is uh, kind of rehabilitating or they're at, they're at risk of derailing in some way. So uh, this person typically has been a great contributor at the company for a, a relatively long period of time. Uh, but for some reason, they've reached an inflection point where they just started to experience some some challenges. So maybe they started rubbing people the wrong way. Maybe they had some interpersonal difficulties. Maybe they maybe they didn't buy into the new strategy, uh, and they, they you know they didn't get on board with it. They're not on the bus, and uh, they they maybe they they decided to be a bit independent in their their group, and their work group is not working well with other people. I mean, there's many reasons why someone can uh, experience sort of uh, risk factors in their career, but then in those cases, typically. Um, they'll get nominated for a leadership program as a way to help them collect and process and think through important feedback messages that they that the company thinks that they need to hear in order for them to improve their performance. So sometimes the company gives them those messages in advance and sometimes not it's like like I could get hired to help deliver those messages and what's you know perceived to be a fairly um, you know fair, just um, high integrity kind of process. Um, so, so th that's another, and that's another case. And so, hopefully, they they hear that message, or those messages, they process it, and they they build some constructive goals to to kind of address those those risk areas. Okay, let me just pause there uh, and see if anyone has any questions. I haven't seen any in the chat box, but I just want to check if anybody would like to ask something so far. And normally, how long is the process from start to the end? Yeah, that kind of depends on the um, the level of urgency the participant has. Um, but for me, it's uh, I would say I would say nine months is, uh, is is pretty typical. It could it could drag on though if people um, you know they get pulled into other things and other priorities. But um, six months would be fast. Um, but different programs have different um, levels of intensity. And that diagram I showed you with the chevrons, that could be expanded or contracted like an accordion. So it can be elongated or it can be condensed. And so the structure of the program also has some, some influence on how long it takes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah welcome. It, it also depends on whether there's, sometimes there's no coaching at the end of it. So it's just like you stop at the development planning phase. And once the development plan's done, you, you're, you're done. If there's coaching, uh, it, it can it can take longer and and sometimes clients they they only want to do coaching when they uh, when they feel like it so they might have six sessions and they or seven sessions but they they just want to kind of call you when they need it and so they 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 have kind of a just in time sort of approach uh, which is fine um, everybody just has a different preference <clears throat> okay so let's talk a bit about uh, feedback so uh, you know some people say feedback is a gift. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, I, in my experience, I think most people feel a little bit differently about it. So they might feel more like some of these guys clinging to the fishing boats, waiting for the big wave to hit them. Um, and uh, so in my, in my experience, you know, getting feedback can be very strenuous, very uh, anxiety provoking. And in fact, I've come to the conclusion that having, you know, receiving feedback is probably the hardest part of the leadership development process. And I think it's so hard because you're, when people receive feedback, you're really challenging the fundamental assumptions they hold about who they are and how people see them and how how everything works at their at their at their job. Uh, years ago, I was in Victoria, British Columbia, and um, I experienced an earthquake for the first time. And I don't know about you, but when you have spent your whole life feeling, you know, assuming that the ground is solid underneath your feet, and then all of a sudden it starts to move around and shake around, that's a very destabilizing kind of experience. And I think people that go through um, receiving in-depth assessment feedback in these kinds of programs are maybe feeling something similar. It's sort of like somebody took their life and they shook it up like a snow globe and everything everything just got all mixed up and and uh, they can feel very disoriented. So maybe in part because of that, uh, receiving feedback is a bit of an emotional roller coaster. So the people tend to see the positives as like maybe more positive than they expected. Oh, I didn't know that people thought I was that great. But they may also see the negatives as more critical. Or they may take any small, um, you know, minor criticism, and they may kind of uh, believe that it's stronger than it actually is, <clears throat> or maybe stronger than I would I would interpret it as as a as an external kind of observer. 
So it's a real up and down emotional roller coaster. So if you do find yourself going through one of these kinds of programs and you are feeling strong emotions when you get the feedback, I would say, you know, just welcome to the club. Like uh, it's a big, it's a big club. It's an inclusive club and uh, you're human. So that everybody feels that way. And one thing I suggest is that people just go through their uh, their feedback multiple times. And that really tends to help kind of settle emotions. I had a professor in university once in an English literature class who said, you know, when you when you read through a novel in the second or third time, it's amazing what you what you can pick up on that you didn't see you know, the first time through. And I think the exact same thing is true for feedback. You can you know, once when you read through it multiple times, your emotions start to settle, and then eventually you, you you process the information in a totally different way, and you can pick up new things and new insights that can be very helpful. And you and you really start to to think about it in ways that involve like action planning and okay, what am I going to do with this? Um, <clears throat> at this early stage of feedback, I often remind uh, participants that the feedback uh, receiver or the, the participant themselves they have a lot of agency in the process, even though it feels like the wave is coming at them and they're um, you know, they're going to be hit by this, this feedback and they're kind of a uh, victim to it. Um, I tell them that they actually have more agency than they may, than they may realize. So they get to decide, well, first of all, in the programs that I run, I only send the report to, to them. I don't send it to anybody else at the company. So they decide if they want to share it with other people or not. Um, they get to decide what goals they write for themselves. Uh, they get to decide what, uh, types of conversations they have with their coach when they get to the coaching process. So they, they really are in the driver's seat, even though they might feel like they're, um, you know, they're, this, this feedback is hitting them and impacting them and they feel um, a little bit out of control. Another thing I say to, to people is that um, the data isn't perfect, but it's still very useful. And so what I mean by that is, uh, and sorry guys about my, um, my camera, hopefully it'll come back into focus here. Um, <clears throat> but I say that the, you know, going through this process, I sort of see my role as, as, as uh, one where I'm trying to hold up a mirror to the clients. And um, the mirror is kind of like the feedback. So I want, I want the client to be able to see themselves in the mirror as clearly as possible. And my, I sort of see my job is to polish this mirror as much as I can and to make it as crystal clear of an image that's coming back to them as possible. But I'm doing that. And I'm also realizing that no matter how much I polish that mirror, there's always going to be some blemishes on. There's always going to be some spots and some imperfections. And that's because there's always going to be some error associated with the assessment results. So, um, you know, there's only so many people we can interview. There's only so many questions we can ask. There's only so much time that we have for each interview. Each raider has a has an imperfect memory of events involving you that they're drawing from. The, the feedback is just a snapshot in time. And, you know, maybe if the organization is going through some stressful events, some of the bias will filter into your feedback and, and affect the, the kinds of messages you receive. So I want people to recognize that the data is imperfect and it's flawed and it's, it's not the truth. It's not uh, chiseled on stone tablets on top of Mount Sinai. But at the same time, it's a pretty good working representation of how people see you uh, on the job and how they see your leadership skills. So let's Let's take, let's acknowledge the imperfection and let's also take the good parts of it and use that going forward uh, to kind of launch the, uh, the coaching process. Okay. <clears throat> Oops. The other way that I think about feedback is uh, it's kind of like you're trying to close the gap between intention and impact. So we all have intentions that underlie our behaviors at work. Um, but sometimes our intentions don't come through to other people and the kind of impact our behavior has on people is different than what we originally intended. So there's a gap between our intentions and our impact. And what feedback is trying to do is it's really trying to close that gap and bring, bring those two things, uh, the intention and the impact as close together as possible. And we understand that no matter how hard we try, we're, not, we're never going to fully close that gap. Like we'll go through the feedback process and we'll squeeze that gap together. And then naturally over time, it'll creep, it'll creep wider again, it'll creep wider. But, uh, but hopefully we learn some skills like, you know, asking feedback uh, for feedback on regular occasions. Maybe we'll go through another leadership process in a couple of years and we'll try to squeeze that gap uh, tighter and, and, and smaller once again. But, um, but that's part of what we're trying to do when we get feedback is really align our, our intentions with the kind of impact it has on other people. Another thing I say to people is that um, <clears throat> sorting and depersonalizing and then acting on feedback is, is really what we're focus what we're practicing when we get feedback and it's an enduring extremely valuable skill that you use until the day that you retire so um so really what we want to do is we want to be able to just efficiently look at look through the feedback okay what's useful what's not here 
depersonalize and distance ourselves from it so we don't have a strong emotional reaction to it. And then take the stuff that we think is valuable and just like throw the throw the rest of it away, like throw the rest to the side of the road and then just forget about it, move on with our lives, right? And that's that kind of like healthy depersonalized way of using feedback, I think is extremely valuable. I think it's an executive level skill. I think it's an important leadership skill. Uh, it's not something that I advertise in terms of why people should go through these programs, but it's something that, uh, that definitely people get a chance to practice. And I think it's a, a really, really valuable uh, part of this process. Okay, last thing I'll say is just that it doesn't matter so much what your feedback says or where you start from. It matters where you where, where you go with it or what where you finish, so to speak. So I don't really care what people's feedback says. If it's positive, it's negative, it doesn't really matter to me. What matters to me is what people think about their feedback and therefore what it implies about what they wanna do about that feedback. So the content of the feedback doesn't really matter. What it says doesn't really matter. It just matters what people do with it. So um, it's great to try to adopt that future focus and that action focus when you're uh, getting ready to um, uh, think about setting some goals based on your feedback. Okay. Okay, let's talk about goal setting. <clears throat> I'd like you to, to introduce you to um, <clears throat> Carl Russell, who is pictured here sitting on what looks like an I-beam um, on the 88th floor of the Empire State Building construction site. This photo was taken in September 1930. Um, Laurie, I don't know if you've been to the Empire State Building recently, but is it is it actually, is it like 88 floors tall? It's, I think it's more than 88 floors. I think it's like 101, but oh yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> I didn't realize it was that. I mean, I thought the old, the World Trade Centers were, I knew they were, I knew they had 100 floors, but I didn't know the Empire State was that high. Anyway, um, and I realized this was just like taken like a week before, I just realized it was taken like a week before my father was born uh, in 1930. So <clears throat> it's, uh, you know, safety safety protocols were not what they were, were, not, <laughs> were different back then than what they are now. So um, there's some great old historical photos of, uh, of the building site. But the reason why I want to use that in the presentation was because um, I think of development planning, I think of goal setting as kind of like a, a scaffolding. Uh, it's like a scaffolding, it's like a, it's like a semi-structure, a mini-structure, uh, something that gives a basic structure to the leadership development process and helps to set up the action taking or the coaching phase of the, of the leadership uh, program. So something, you just constantly go back to the development plan, use it as a reference point. You don't have to talk about it in your, you know, coaching sessions, but you can always go back to it and say, okay, well, what, what did you, what did you want to work on again? And are we, are we achieving those goals? Like, are we moving in the right direction uh, on those goals? So it's a really important uh, step. And there's lots of different ways to go about goal setting. There's actually a lot of pop popular books about goal setting uh, on the market these days. You might've seen some of them like uh, tiny habits and atomic habits and, Lots of different books about habits. So um, anyway, so I'll tell you what I think about goal setting and you let me know later on if, you, if you've got different thoughts. But um, in the programs that I run, uh, I usually do interview-based 360s. It take at least six weeks to collect data from like anywhere from 10 to 15 people. And uh, so in, while the people are waiting for the feedback, I often ask them to create an early version of their goal plan before they get their sort of real feedback. And um, I think this is a really helpful step. I think uh, it's great to get the sort of the wheels turning and, and get warmed up in terms of thinking about, okay, what do I need? What, do I, what should I be working on? I find that uh, <clears throat> people often are pretty good at coming up with goals that they, that, they, that they eventually just keep in their plan. Like usually they'll, you know, they'll write a list of goals that they, they might consider doing before they get the feedback. And then after they get the feedback, they usually keep at least one of those goals. So, so um, sometimes you come up with a really good goal and if you can, uh, or if you want to, you can just start working on it right away. You don't have to wait till you get the feedback. Um, and then I find it really kickstarts the goal setting process after you get the feedback. So once you've debriefed all the feedback, you've already got this like straw plan created and usually just clients just make like small tweaks to it. So I find it's a good, it's a good step in the process. How do you do goal setting? Uh, you might ask, well, um, it's it's pretty like nonlinear and iterative. I, usually I start by suggesting to people like, just start, start with what resonates with you. Like, what are you thinking about in between the meetings? What are you waking up at night, you know, thinking about? What are you thinking about when you drive, you're driving in your car and you have those in-between moments in your life? Like what kinds of themes are sticking with you? What are the three buckets that occur to you as being the most important themes um, that are coming out of this process? And then, We'll just kind of start really broad, kind of like a like a funnel, 
top of the funnel. Okay, what's the headline? What's the label of that bucket? And then we'll get more specific. Okay, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? And we'll just have a conversation where we try to specify those goals. Um, and then we iterate. So the client will, will write some things down on paper, send it to me. I'll give some feedback. They'll make revisions. We'll go back and forth in several cycles like that and just try to build out some, some uh, structure to the goals. Um, one thing I would say is that you should uh, look for the overlap between the feedback and what you want to work on. So some people might just approach this process, especially because their their company may be paying for it. and might just say, well, I just, I'm just going to take all the feedback that I got and I'm, I'm just going to distill it down to like the three most important points from the feedback report. And that's going to be my, my, my goal plan. And uh, I think, I think it's important to take that a step further and to try to filter the feedback you get through your own inner kind of voice and inner um compass and sense of what you want to do with this information so uh sometimes people i work with like they'll select two different goals that really link well with the feedback but then they have another goal in mind they'll say you know tim i don't know i kind of want to set this third goal and but it doesn't have anything to do with the feedback and i'll say great let's just put it in the plan you know like the feedback's not perfect it's not comprehensive it's just you know a snapshot sometimes sometimes the feedback is just dead wrong like people don't have all the have all the context and all the background information to give you accurate feedback about certain topics and they may get it wrong so if you have a intrinsic kind of voice that's telling you you want to focus on something i would say listen to that voice and try to find some kind of marriage or some kind of reconciliation between the the messages and the feedback and also what what you just personally want to work on and make sure both of those are reflected in the in the goals Okay, balance challenge with attainability. So uh, leaders and executives are busy people. And one thing I constantly worry about is helping them through a process like this and then overloading them with even more goals. You know, like here's the 200th goal that you need to be, you know, you need to be working on in your life and in your career and, and having it be a demotivational kind of exercise. So <clears throat> the takeaway for me here is that uh, we know that challenge is good. We know that difficult goals tend to produce better res results, but they need to be they need to be placed in context with all the other goals the leader is working on. So my takeaway is, leaders should set goals that are as challenging as possible while still believing that they're attainable. So how how challenging can you set the goals while still making sure that you feel a sense of like optimism that you can you can get there, you can get to the finish line, and that optimism and that hope is is actually really important. So. Related to that, the second point here is, um, you know, just just let's not boil the ocean. You know, set three goals, three actions each max, and uh, you know, if you got something else you want to work on, let's come back to it in a year. You know, put put it in the file drawer and, and pull it out. You know, set a calendar reminder to to pull it out in a year, and then see what you want to do with it at that point. But let's focus on the most important um, priorities. Also, I would suggest uh, to think about actions in broader ways. So sometimes we think about actions when we're goal setting in terms of like, oh, this is like a, a, an action I need to take once, almost like a, an item on my to-do list and I tick it off and once it's done, it's done. But there's actually all kinds of different actions you can set for yourself. You can take learning actions, you know, take actions to learn something new, to take a course, to learn a new skill. You can set an action related to practicing a skill regardless of how well you might perform that skill but just just to do the skill just to get some time uh you know time um, accumulated actually just doing the skill and getting familiar with the skill excuse me you could just, uh, set an action to routinize something so create a recurring routine in your life so every tuesday at 9 a.m i'm going to sit down and i'm going to do some strategic planning and that's going to be my strategic planning time uh you could um set an action related to producing a certain kind of response in a certain kind of situation so these are usually written as if then statements so if this type of if, if situation x happens then i'm going to respond with y um, so it's a very situation specific kind of response you can set an action also to uh, to conduct experiments so this is when you uh, make a plan to go out into the world in between your coaching sessions and try something new and try a new behavior and um, you come back to the next coaching session, you just debrief it. How did it go? What happened? What, what, what worked well? You know, maybe, it, maybe it's something like in my next meeting with my, my boss and my team, I'm going to ask a provocative question to my boss in front of everybody. And I'm going to, I'm going to be constructive and I'm going to say, you know, look, I would just want the best outcome possible for this project. And that's where I'm coming from. My intentions are good, but here's my provocative question. I really want to push the envelope on this and just see what happens. You know, does your boss love it? Do they get upset it's somewhere in the middle? So those are those are experiments. 
Okay, this next one is really important. Uh, this, uh, this, first of all, if goals are really complex, it's great to smash them into little pieces and try to pick up the pick up two or three pieces and just work on those so that they feel more manageable and, and realistic. But also, you may want to, if you feel that a goal is really complex, you may want to ask yourself if you, instead of setting a performance goal, you sh you might want to set a learning goal. And what I mean by that is. Performance goals are worded in such a way that they're trying to elicit like more effort and drive and motivation. And they sort of assume that you already have the skills needed to do that task. And you just need to try harder, basically. Uh, learning goals, on the other hand, are ones where you, uh, or sorry, I should say, um, there are some cases though, where if you don't have the skills needed to do the task, just setting a, setting a performance goal where you're pushing your motivation harder is not gonna get you it's not going to lead to better performance. It's not going to help you um, produce a better outcome. So if you don't have the skill needed to do a task, you might need to sort of pause and then pivot towards setting a learning goal where you set a goal to actually go out and find the knowledge and the information and the strategies that you need to succeed at that task, to gain mastery of that task. And then once you've acquired all that information and knowledge and strategies, then you can set a performance goal where you, you know, push yourself to, to work harder at it. So if goals are feeling really complex, think about setting a learning goal uh, and just kind of filling in the gaps of some of your knowledge uh, before pushing yourself to basically try harder at it. Okay, and this is also important as a last step in the goal setting process. Once the goals are complete and formalized, I always suggest to participants, they take their, they take their goals, they meet with the raters. Usually it's, this happens one-on-one. -on -one. They thank them for their feedback. They share their goals with them. So in effect, making those goals public. And then they invite the uh, the raiders to basically become allies in their development going forward and say, hey, you know what? Uh, first, thank you for the feedback. I appreciate it. Didn't go into a black hole. Secondly, um, these are the goals that I set based on your valuable input. And third, hey, if you see opportunities to give me feedback about these goals in the future, whether it's positive or constructive, I want you to know I'm open for business. I want you to know I'm really receptive to that. So please come to me. Uh, know that I'll really appreciate that. Um, and that's uh, that's a step that I think can really build build positive relationships. You feel like there's other people out there supporting you as you work to work to develop your skills. Okay, let me uh, talk a bit about coaching. So, <clears throat> when you think about coaching, um, as you may have done, because it's a word that's often used in in modern society and modern the modern business world, I wonder what do you what do you think about? Um, because if you're like me, um, or you're like some of the people that I, that I work with, um, your mental model, your understanding of what coaching is might kind of overlap with, um, with sort of popular notions of coaching. For example, like athletic, what athletic coaches do, or what sports coaches do, and what we watch them do on TV. And if you think that, then I, I'm just going to kind of caution that that could be problematic uh, for a couple of reasons. So I just picked it's not hard to find but it's picked an image here of a football coach grabbing a player by the scruff of the neck usually you know guy doesn't look very happy it doesn't look like it's a positive conversation um the guy in the receiving end doesn't look very happy but you know there's a lot of hostility in this picture i'll show this uh <clears throat> other picture this one's from february 1985 this is uh, bobby knight he was the head basketball coach at indiana university bloomington indiana and uh, they had a great team at the time, but he was a real hot-headed guy. And in this uh, this game, he um, was upset at the referees and decided to pick up a chair and threw it across the floor. <laughs> I mean, this day and age, he would probably would have got suspended for like half the season. But back then, I think he like took a couple games off and he was right back at it. But um, anyway, my point is that um, these colloquial notions of coaching, I think, can be problematic in terms of understanding how coaching operates in a leadership development context. So they sort of assume that like a power imbalance, right, like uh, sports coaches uh, tell the athlete what to do and what the plays are and where to go. But in real coaching or in leadership development coaching, it's not like that at all. Like the participant actually has a lot of power. The participant gets to... Um, you know, decide what they, like I said, what, what goals they set for themselves, what they talk about in the coaching coaching discussions. Like they, they actually have a lot of agency in the process. Another thing that you might notice is like uh, in those images of co co sports coaches is that um, sometimes they engage, engage in these demonstrative, almost attention-seeking kinds of behaviors. But in uh, leadership coaching, like 
the last thing I want to do as a coach is like draw, draw the spotlight to myself. I want to keep the spotlight on the participant. I want them thinking about their issues and marinating in some of their challenges. Right. So the way I think about coaching is, is it's much more of a, 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 a kind of a supportive partnership uh, kind of relationship where you're walking with side by side um, the person that you're working with and they're, you're on a long journey and you're just really trying to support them in that journey and, and helping them to get to where they want to go. And just like in this picture, there's a vast expanse of different directions in which they could travel and they have to choose. You need to help them choose where they, you know, what direction they want to travel in. And then you guys kind of go in that direction together. You don't get, you don't get too far in front of them, right? You don't, you're not leading them. You're not the expert. You're not telling them what to do. You're, just, you're walking side by side with them. So, <clears throat> so I would ask you to just think about the word coach in a slightly different way. Um, People often ask me, well, what's what, what's a coaching session like, or what, what happens in a coaching session? And it's a bit like verbal journaling. So what I mean by that is, you, you know, the the participant shares something that's going on in their in their life, in their world, in their career. The coach is usually listening very carefully, and then they paraphrase back what the what the person has said, and then. As they're paraphrasing that back, the, the participant, the leader, stands at the side, almost like they're reading their words in a journal, but in this case, it's a verbal, uh, you know, it's a verbal kind of reading, readout. They, they see and hear their own words at a bit of a distance, and then somewhere in that process, they, they say, yeah, you know what, Tim, like, now that I hear you say that, I can start to see a bit of an order and a bit of a structure into some of what I was saying there, and then that kind of suggests to me like this is the action I should take. And it's like, boom, all of a sudden you've got some momentum to, to take an action. So, so coaching sessions are very much like that. And that's, that's a bit of the, the magic of what can happen is people get to stand at, at the side of their thoughts and just kind of reflect on them. And then uh, intuitively get, they get insights about how to act. Uh, I'll also say that um, <clears throat> structure is really important in coaching engagements. So uh, you know, we talked about the assessment process, the feedback, the goal setting, all those are structural components of, a, of an engagement that feed into the coaching and really support it and create momentum uh, for coaching. Sorry, my camera's a bit off, guys. Um, there's also other structural components like um, something I call the confidentiality policy, which, which is a document that I circulate to all the participants at the start of a process sorry, all the like the participant and all the raters at the start of a process. And it just says like how I plan to um, take care of the um, like private information that I collect um, in the in the data gathering phase and the assessment phase. So I only send the report to the participant. I don't send it to HR or anybody else. And it also outlines how I plan to keep the, the coaching conversations private. You know, I don't have offline conversations with the boss where the participant is not involved for the duration of the engagement. Don't get involved in any evaluative discussions about the participants. I know I, I up for a promotion or if God forbid that somebody's thinking of, of firing them. Excuse me, I don't get involved. It's this is only a developmental process. So it just gives some structure in terms of like what I will and won't do as a coach and what how how I will or won't share information and how I plan to protect privacy and confidentiality. And paradoxically, that really creates some safety and some freedom for the coach and the the uh, the leader to have a really open trusting relationship. Another thing I would say is that you know leaders should take ownership of the process. You know, so they should feel comfortable coming to the the coaching discussion, saying this is what I want to talk about, this is what this is where I want the conversation to go. If they don't have that in mind, the coach will also you know will usually have a shadow agenda or suggestions of what you can talk about. But you should feel free to kind of dictate what what the you know how the conversations unfold. Uh, I would also say that <clears throat> the uh, alliance, or, or what I mean here is the, uh, the the relationship between the coach and the participant, is is everything. It's really really important. It's highly predictive of the how how positive the outcomes are at the end of an engagement. So if you're in a process like this and you feel like something's off with the alliance, like you say to yourself, oh, you know, at the end of that last meeting, <clears throat> my coach he said something. And what did he mean by that? Like, I don't know what he meant. Like he was, was, you know, is he on my side? Is he not on my side? Like, I feel like, I feel kind of, I feel upset by that and kind of wounded by that. If that's something like that comes up, uh, you should definitely put it on the table with your coach and ask to talk about it and clarify it. If your coach is, uh, is skilled, they'll notice that type of thing and they'll address it before you have the chance to, but you should definitely feel uh, empowered to, to raise that. <clears throat> And then uh, the, the last point in this slide is just that ambivalence is uh, really normal. So if you get into a coaching engagement and you say to yourself, gosh, you know, there's one 
one side of me that says, ah, you know, maybe I should change. But maybe there's another side that says, ah, I kind of like the way I'm doing things right now. And oh, it's a real tug of war between those two voices. If you're feeling that way, again, that's really normal. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a typical part of any change process. And uh, if your coach is skilled, they'll help you kind of work through those different voices and how to, how to resolve some of that ambivalence. Uh, okay, just last thing I'll mention is um, uh, these are some of the topics that you can discuss in a coaching engagement. Basically, anything related to work, usually personal stuff is not included unless there's a direct relationship with uh, a work topic. Uh, you can talk about the development plan. You can talk about roadblocks on your way to developing. You can talk about some of those experiments. You can talk about situational stuff, something that just came up last week. It's not, you know, not in my development plan, but gosh, I'd really love to get your thoughts on this and problem solve with it, Mr. and Mrs. Coach. Um, that's fair game. <clears throat> and then the last uh, bullet here is process discussion. So that just refers to um, basically talking about the process. How is this working for you? How is it not working for you? Um, you know, how, how are you finding our working relationship? Uh, how are you finding the cadence? Are we you know, taking too much time between sessions or not enough time? Um, you know, that, those kinds of process discussions can be very, very, very valuable. Okay, I know we're running short on time, but if you do have any questions, I'd love to uh, entertain them and um, and hear you know what makes sense to you, what doesn't make sense, or if I'm missing anything. And if, if and you can also contact me offline. I'll put up my contact information in a moment here. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I saw your message there, and uh, thanks for coming. Oh, I think he's already left. <laughs> Okay, um, I was just going to say here at the end that um, if you or anybody you know is interested in leadership development, going through a, a leadership development program, I'd love to be a resource to you, so please let me know. Um, also, this presentation is based on three articles I wrote for my newsletter, and so you can check out the newsletter at, uh, at this website, and if you're interested in getting some original articles on leadership topics, Deliver to your inbox. You can also sign up for the uh, uh, for, to receive the newsletter. And this is my uh, contact information. If you'd like to get a hold to me, a hold of me, excuse me. And most of all, I just want to say thanks for having me. It's it great to be part of your your group again, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to to connect with you guys. <laughs>